everyone. All right. So in case you didn't hear, Texas effectively banned abortions in the state in a frankly wild new law called SB8. And the Supreme Court just, um, just let it happen. So let's break this all down and talk about what the hell is going on. All right. Um, first, if you're new here, hi, my name's Lija. I'm a real life lawyer on a mission to demystify the law and how it affects your everyday life. That being said, I may be a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Nothing that I say should ever be construed as legal advice. And you should always seek the advice of licensed attorneys before making any legal decision. Super chats and stickers are currently enabled. Today, any proceeds made off of those super chats and stickers, I will be donating directly to some orgs that are helping women get people. And again, I'm going to try to be gender neutral here because not only women can get pregnant, if you have questions about that, uh, I'll direct you to Google. Um, but all the funds that I will be earning today via super chats and um, stickers will be donated to funds helping people get the hell out of Texas to get their abortions because that's basically what we're at. All right. Um, I will say though that I respect your time. So I'm going to just jump into the meat of this. So hold your questions for the end. Okay. So let's just get into the basics. Um, the law it's called SB eight. That stands for Senate bill eight out of the Texas legislature. Okay. Bam. It was passed back in May and went into effect September 1st, so like a couple days ago. Um, I've linked the text of the bill down below in the description, but basically there are two parts to it that we need to dissect to really understand it. One is the actual ban on abortion part. The other is the enforcement of the ban part. So let's start with the language that actually does the abortion banning. So that language says, a physician may not knowingly perform or induce an abortion on a pregnant woman if the physician detected a fetal heartbeat for the unborn child as required by section 171.203 or failed to perform a test to detect a fetal heartbeat. This is a fetal heartbeat bill. Um, at six weeks is when you can, generally six weeks is when you can start to detect the faintest flutter of what might become the heart of an embryo. Um, they're fairly common, these types of laws. None so far have been allowed to go into effect. Um, we'll talk about the constitutionality of it in a second. Um, but nothing about this is groundbreaking. Um, the law also gives exceptions in cases of medical emergencies. So there are instances in Texas still in which you can technically get an abortion if it's before six weeks or a medical emergency as determined by the doctor. But as we know, the vast majority of abortions do not fall into those categories. We're talking like 85, 90% at least. Because in case you've uh, never met someone with a uterus or spoken to them. Um, it's not uncommon to have your regular periods. Six weeks means two weeks after a missed period if you're regular. So six weeks often doesn't give people the time to even realize they've missed a period unless they are like clockwork regular, which is not the norm. All right. Okay. This next provision, however, sorry, there's gonna be a lot of dramatic pauses and sighing throughout this. This next provision is where things get tricky, okay? It's the second part, the enforcement mechanism, meaning, okay, we have banned abortions after six weeks. Now, who has the power to enforce that law? Usually these law, laws give someone like the state's attorney general or district or county attorneys the right to enforce these laws. Not in Texas, y'all. Go big or go home. This one gives private individuals and only private individuals the right to enforce the law. Yeah, let's look at that language here. Okay, the requirements of this subchapter shall be enforced exclusively through the private civil actions described in the chapter. No enforcement of this subchapter may be taken or threatened by the state, a political subdivision, a district or county attorney, or an executive or administrative officer or employer of this state or a political subdivision against any person. So they're saying individual people are the only people that have any sort of remedy to enforce this law. So this is weird. This is not a normal thing we see in abortion laws and it's meant pretty clearly to make this law really difficult to challenge in court. We'll get to that. Let's talk about liability. Who is, who's liable under this law? Any person who performs or induces an abortion in violation of the subchapter knowingly engages in conduct that aids or abets the performance or induction of an abortion. 
including paying for or reimbursing the costs of an abortion through insurance or otherwise, um, regardless of whether the person knew or should have known that the abortion would be performed or induced in violation of this subchapter. So that's anyone who performs the abortion and anyone who aids and abets the performance of an abortion, including through donation money. Or if it's an Uber driver dropping you off at the abortion clinic. So effectively what's happening is this law is giving any Joe fucking schmo off the street, doesn't even have to be a Texan, anyone, the right to sue anyone who they see performing abortions before or after six weeks or assisting in the performance of an abortion after six weeks. And if they win the lawsuit, um, there's some damages that could be had. So uh, let's let's take a look at uh, what happens <laughs> if someone brings this suit and wins, okay? Um, if a claimant prevails in an action brought under this section, the court shall award injunctive relief, meaning that the judge will tell them to stop performing the abortions, and statutory damages in an amount of not less than $10,000 for each abortion that the defendant performed or induced in violation of this subchapter, and each abortion that the performed or induced in violation of this subchapter that the defendant aided or abetted in and costs and attorney's fees. All right. That's what you win if you sue someone under this law. Um, and so any person that gets sued and lose has to pay at least $10,000 per abortion, which effectively means that any place that provides abortion simply cannot continue to function because they can be slammed with lawsuit after lawsuit and be held liable um, for every single abortion they perform. And that's not just the clinics, it's anyone. And like, I've done some, I've dabbled in being an escort at uh, Minneapolis abortion clinics and people don't typically show up to the clinic alone. Not everyone who shows up to an abortion clinic is there to get an abortion, I'll note, but people were showing up with moms, sisters, partners, like obviously you want emotional support. Those people driving them to their report, appointment to get the abortion could be held liable under this law. Um, so the number of p potential people that could get sued under this law is pretty staggering, not to mention that it encourages vigilantism at a scale we've never seen in an abortion law before. Like, what's next? Like, what are we going to let random schmucks um, just enforce? You know, because even though there are laws that give private citizens the right to enforce the law through civil action, they don't do so while also cutting out the government's ability to enforce the law. And this is where there is a constitutional right at issue. So, like... We're not just dealing with some random law here. The constitutional issues are at stake. So it seems pretty clear that this was written explicitly to confuse the procedural processes of the courts, which is exactly what it did. So that's the law. Like I said, it was passed back in May. And in July, a lawsuit was filed to challenge the constitutionality of the law. This lawsuit was eventually called Whole Women's Health at All v. Jackson at All. Um, my dog has just climbed into her bed next to me so there will be grunts and snores ensuing please enjoy maybe she'll make an appearance at the end so let's get into the constitutional groundwork and lay the context of this lawsuit out first before we dive into the lawsuit itself so i've already made a video dissecting roe v wade go watch that after this if you want the background but basically Roe built off of a number of previous cases before it that people that found that people had a right to privacy under the 14th Amendment in things like contraception and procreation. And Roe v. Wade built off that and holds that people have a right to privacy in their choice of whether or not to procreate or to be pregnant, meaning that the state can't intervene. And it's supposed to be, and, and so any intervention at the beginning of a pregnancy until viability, um, any any um, abortion should be between the pregnant person and their physician. It's a constitutional right under Roe v. Wade. There's a weighing of interests that, happenings, but that happens between the state and the health of the mother and in the health of the child. Um, and Roe v. Wade said that the interests of the state don't come into play until after viability, which is 22 to 24 weeks-ish. So there can be bans on late stage abortions because they say that the state does have a, a valid interest in protecting the life of a viable fetus. Um, but before that, the state has no legitimate interest and can't regulate, according to Roe v. Wade. Now, Roe v. Wade has since been narrowed, and it's been interpreted to mean that states can regulate abortions, they can regulate abortions in various ways, so long as it doesn't create an undue burden on the pregnant person in seeking 
an abortion. But um, there are many things that have been found to not not um be undue burdens that like i don't know how they how they got here but 24 hour waiting period before being able to get the abortion that's been found to be fine not an undue burden even though i'll remind you there are people who have to drive hours and hours to get to their nearest abortion clinic so then they have to find lodging that night um requiring a person getting the abortion to inform the other parent to get parental consent if they're minors and in minnesota where i'm at uh, it is also required that sometimes if a minor wants to get an abortion, they could be pulled before a judge and the judge determines whether or not they are mature enough to make the decision to have an abortion, which if we follow that logic through to its end would mean that if they're found to not be mature enough to get an abortion, then they are mature enough to have a child. Right. Also, it's not an undue burden to be required to receive medical literature before you're able to get an abortion. There is no requirement that this medical literature be medically accurate or necessary. It truly boggles the mind. None of these undue burdens. But, however, fetal heartbeat bills have been found to be unconstitutionally burdensome on people seeking abortions because of the aforementioned fact that pregnancies often cannot be detected by six weeks, let alone an abortion scheduled. You know, you need time to make the appointment, to get things in order, to even make the decision to have an abortion to begin with. These fetal heartbeat bans basically effectively, in their effect, ban all abortions. It is decidedly unconstitutional it has been decided that these that these bills are not constitutional under current supreme court precedent um, the texas legislature knew this though so they threw a wrench into the mix by allowing only private citizens to enforce the law this makes the law very difficult to challenge in court and here's why when a law like this is passed typically um, and some entity or person wants to challenge its constitutionality they will go before a judge and ask for an in, ask for an injunction before the law can be even come into force. Um, and so they sue the person who is tasked with enforcing the law in court to get the judge to enjoin that person from enforcing the law. So if the law clearly says that the you know district attorney is the one who has the power to enforce the law, then you sue the district attorney in their official capacity and ask the judge to enjoin the the district attorney from enforcing the law, the judge does so, the law doesn't become enforced. It's not in force. Um, <clears throat> in this case, who do you sue? All of people? Everyone? Like, you can't name all private citizens, all individuals, as a defendant. You just kind of have to speculate, like, take shots in the dark as to who would be the best person to sue to try to get the law thrown out. And that's pretty much what happened. Um, so again, the cases that, that was brought in July after this law passed in May, <clears throat> it's called Whole Woman's Health et al. v. Austin Reeve Jackson Judge et al. The et al.s mean that there are more parties to the case, and the name has been shortened. And boy howdy, <laughs> are there uh, quite a few names in this case. That's, that's the full case title. I'm not going to read that for you, obviously, but just to give you an idea of like the number of parties we have we're dealing with here so whole women's health is an org that provides abortions and advocates for abortion rights and they were joined by a number of similar orgs as well as some private citizens and then austin reeve jackson is a texas judge and um, they named every state trial ju court judge and county court clerk in texas in this lawsuit among others um, because theoretically those are the people that are going to be enforcing this law um, if someone sues under the law and brings it to court, the judge is the one that is going to enforce whether or not there is a judgment for damages under this law. So they're thinking, all right, let's sue those people because they are obviously going to be involved. <clears throat> uh, the claims in, in this lawsuit are fairly straightforward, basically that the law violates the Constitution, a person's right to have an abortion under the 14th Amendment for various reasons. I've linked the original complaint down below as well in case you want to read it. It's good for kind of getting a feel of the various substantive claims that are brought in challenging uh, abortion laws like this. Um, they also claim that the law is quasi-criminalization because this is a civil, this is not a criminal law. It just is kind of acting like a criminal law by letting any private citizen just kind of enforce it, sue under it. Um, 
the the quasi criminalization of aiding and abetting abor abortion specifically is vague and it violates and then also that the law violates the freedom of speech under the first amendment those are all in this lawsuit um what's really at issue here though because again the law itself has already been found to be unconstitutional in other state contexts when other states have tried to bring fetal heartbeat bills What's really at issue here is procedural, and that's the wrench that the Texas legislature meant to throw into the mix. It's whether these people, the judges, the court clerks, and the other individuals named in the lawsuit are the correct people to sue. There's also a question of whether federal courts can even hear the case because it's a state law being forced by state judges, but the real meat of it is, are these people the correct people to sue? Anyway, so... The defendants filed a motion to dismiss saying that they weren't the proper parties being sued under the law and that they were immune anyway because they were being sued in their official capacities. And the judge at the district court denied this motion to dismiss, saying that they were, in fact, the proper parties because the plaintiffs were just asking to enjoin the defendants from enforcing the law, which is an exception to official immunity. We're not going to go down official immunity uh, can of worms right now, but that's, that's what happened. They, they said they're not immune in this instance. And the district court then had scheduled an evidentiary hearing on August 30th regarding the preliminary injunction that they requested, that the plaintiffs requested. So a preliminary injunction is basically asking the court to tell the defendants they cannot enforce the law while this case gets decided. So they ask for that to get the law temporarily barred until they can get a permanent injunction through the court because these things take time. So they ask for a, a temporary, in, a preliminary injunction at the beginning just to get it stayed while they figure things out. <clears throat> And so the evidentiary hearing for that motion was set for August 30th. And an evidentiary hearing is kind of like a mini trial. Um, it gives the parties the opportunity to present their witnesses and their evidence on each side and argue each side before the judge um, regarding their request for this preliminary injunction. So that was scheduled for August 30th. However, the denial of the motion to dismiss was appealed to the Fifth Circuit. So you've got District Court, Fifth Circuit, Supreme Court. Those are the layers. It was appealed to the Fifth Circuit. And the defendants requested a temporary stay on the proceedings, meaning that preliminary injunction and the hearing, pending the Fifth Circuit's decision on the motion to dismiss. So this case, when it was appealed up to the Fifth Circuit, it was, a, it was um, assigned to a panel of three judges on the Fifth Circuit, two of whom were appointed by Trump. Yet another example of how his judicial appointments are going to affect the laws in this country for decades to come. Um, and then they waited until August 27th, three days before the injunction hearing was to take place, and they issued a ruling. Um, they granted the stay, meaning that the hearing on the preliminary injunction to be happening on the 30th was not going to happen. Um, and they also, at least not on the scheduled day, and then they also asked for briefing from the defendant by August 31st at 9 a.m., ostensibly so that they could get more information from the party as to their arguments related to the motion to dismiss and then make a ruling theoretically on that day, on August 31st. So August 31st rolls around, 9 a.m. passes, and the Fifth Circuit does nothing. So then the plaintiffs appealed the preliminary injunction issue up to the Supreme Court <clears throat> because the law was going to go into effect the next day. Um, and the, this, this appeal was plopped into what's known as the shadow docket. What's the shadow docket on the Supreme Court? We won't get too into the weeds here, but basically the court usually takes time looking over cases, hearing oral arguments, reading briefings, blah, 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 before issuing a signed opinion. However, there are certain instances that allow the court to more quickly hear appeals regarding emergency orders and some technical things. This is where things like emergency stays of execution, this is why they happen at like the 11th hour all the time because they're on this shadow docket and they're an emergency appeal up to the Supreme Court. Um, but usually this shadow docket doesn't get much attention because it's a lot of procedural less smaller issues. However, it has started to become used to really shape the laws in this country, including, for example, um, in this instance, but also in relation to immigration laws, to voting rights issues, and to emergency orders and things due to this pandemic. Um, so this was appealed to the Supreme Court because it was an emergency stay with a short-term time limit on them because, you know, the law was going to take effect September 1st. It was part of the shadow docket. No briefs were read, no hearings for oral arguments were held. 
and they get this appeal on August 31st, the day before the law is supposed to get into, go to effect. They, they accept it. And then on that day, they do nothing. <laughs> nothing happens the night of August 31st. A lot of people who watched the Supreme Court stayed up till midnight to wait for them to issue this decision that never happened. And the law was allowed to go into effect at midnight on, in the morning of September 1st. Then, near midnight the next night, the night of September 1st, the Supreme Court finally issues a ruling. So I know that was a lot. So I made a, a little rudimentary timeline so that so we could follow along. So in May, SB 8 signed into law. July, the lawsuit is filed. Early August, the district court denies the motion to dismiss, sets the hearing for the preliminary injunction for August 30th. August 27th, the Fifth Court Circuit Court grants a stay of the hearing and orders briefing by August 31st. So the hearing does not happen on August 30th. August 31st, first, Fifth, court do, Fifth Circuit Court does nothing. It's appealed to SCOTUS. SCOTUS does nothing. Uh, September 1st, SB 8 goes into effect. The Supreme Court denies a preliminary injunction and motion to lift the stay. So let's dive into that, that decision. So the ruling itself is a page and a half long. Uh, the decision was 5-4, five, 5 justices in favor, 4 opposed. The ruling itself is a page and a half long. The dissents from the ruling are 10 pages long. I've linked it all below if you want to read it. Um, but basically, the ruling acknowledges that there are serious questions as to the constitutionality of this law. Questions that I would argue have already been answered, but sure. There are serious questions as to the constitutionality of the law of issue. However... It also, the ruling also says that there are also novel procedural questions and the plaintiffs have failed to make a showing that the named defendants were the proper ones. Also, they say it's unclear whether the Supreme Court can even issue a decision regarding state court judges enforcing state laws. So the order denies the preliminary injunction and denies lifting the stay pending the Fifth Circuit's decision regarding the motion to dismiss. The order ends by saying this order is not based on any conclusion about the constitutionality of Texas's law and in no way limits other procedurally proper challenges to the Texas law, <clears throat> including in Texas state courts, meaning it doesn't overturn Roe v. Wade or make any ruling as to whether the law is constitutional. It's merely a procedural decision, according to the order. And then each dissenting judges, the four of them, each wrote an opinion with Chief, Chief Justice Roberts agreeing that the procedural issues are novel, but saying that he would have granted an injunction to keep the status quo, to keep the law as it has been, while they suss out the constitutionality arguments. This is not a radical suggestion. This was very much something the court could have done. Grant the injunction. Let's keep things as they are now until we figure out whether or not this is constitutional, especially given the fact the fetal heartbeat laws have been found to be unconstitutional already. Okay, right. So then Justice Sotomayor's dissent opens very iconically with um, a couple lines that I'll, I'll share with you here. It says, this court's order is stunning. Presented with an application to enjoin a flagrantly unconstitutional law engineered to prohibit women and other people from exercising their constitutional rights and evade judicial scrutiny, a majority of justices have opted to bury their heads in the sand. So that's it. <clears throat> the law is allowed to stand. The Supreme Court didn't overrule Roe v. Wade, uh, but it didn't stop a law that is clearly in direct violation of Roe v. Wade from continuing when it very easily could have. It could have stopped it. <clears throat> Uh, this has profound implications uh, because, in part, the court is set to hear a case regarding a Mississippi abortion ban in its upcoming term, which starts in October. <coughs> that one's not even this bad. It, it bans abortions after, like, 15 weeks. Um, I'm planning on going over that in a future video. I kind of want to do a di deep dive into what's coming up in the Supreme Court this upcoming um, session term, um, which maybe sounds kind of dull, but I feel like unless you're a lawyer or, like, a scholar or a court nerd like you don't necessarily know how to even find that information so let me know if you would find that helpful or if you'd want that but given the court's reluctance in this instance to do anything or even enforce its own precedent um, that could indicate what's to come on the abortion related decision to be made this term though of course we don't know we don't know what's going to happen all right so <sighs> thank you to everyone who has 
donated stickers and super chats, everything made during this live stream on stickers and super chats, I will be donating to the funds listed below. Um, so what does this mean going forward? Well, we're at a point where we need to help people get the hell out of Texas uh, if they need abortions. That's the, that's the long and short of it. That's where we're at. There are orgs that are helping with that, though I tend to always suggest mutual aid first before giving to orgs, because if you could donate to a nonprofit, they have a lot of overhead that part of your money goes to. Whereas if someone's just like, I need help and you just give them your money, they'll just be able to help themselves. Um, however, what's fucking insidious about this law is that I'm not sure if you giving mutual aid to someone who's in Texas seeking an abortion would be a violation of this law, would be considered aiding and abetting an abortion. I don't know. So maybe it is better to donate to large orgs who have the capacity and the resources to defend themselves from lawsuits. Who knows? This is, this is really new stuff, this procedural element of it. So it's really unclear kind of who's going to be liable under this and who can be sued and who's going to be doing the suing. So I've included a couple links down below of orgs you could donate to. There are more. Um, I didn't want to overwhelm you with options though, because being overwhelmed can sometimes lead to inaction. Okay. So donate. Step one, donate. Um, if you live in Texas, vote the bastards out of office. All right. Call them, tell them you're mad, write them in a letter, handwrite it. And then type it up and also send that and then send them an email. What's wild is that not a ton of people do that. And so by doing like three points of contact to your local representative, you are um, really making your voice a lot louder than you realize. Um, is it going to do much or make a difference? Maybe not. I don't know. But it's something you can do. And sometimes in times when like these, which feel insane and, and, and like you have no autonomy over the situation or agency, um, sometimes that's all you can do and it's something, all right? If you're not in Texas, check out your abortion laws in your state. What's going on in your state? Call your representatives and tell them how important access to abortion is to you. Call your federal representatives and senators and tell them that you want some federal protections of abortion. All right. If you are in Minnesota, like I am, there is a wonderful org, um, called unrestrict MN, and they will keep you fully abreast of all the abortion related laws in Minnesota. You can find them at unrestrictmn.org. Um, if you're a cis man, maybe check in on the people in your life who have uteruses, uh, give them a, an ear, a shoulder, maybe a homemade meal, maybe consider getting a vasectomy. I don't know. I'm spitballing at this point because we're out of options, people. You know what I mean? Um, I will say also that in times like these, I try to focus inward a little bit on myself and my community because trying to take on the weight of the world when these things pop up is simply too much. You can't, you can't do it. So after you've donated, called your representatives, checked in on your friends, I would also highly suggest putting down the phone. Stop doom scrolling, cut it out. You're not helping anyone by doing that, least of all yourself. This is a message from me to me, all right? That's my soapbox. Thank you to everyone who is donating. We're getting so many donations. I love it. All stickers and super chats, like I said, are going to be donated today to one of the abortion related support funds listed in the description below. I will uh, post on my Instagram. You can follow me at Legion Miller um, and on YouTube after I've donated for accountability purposes. Um, but that's, that's what's happening. So any money spent is going towards that. Thank you so much for your donations. At this point, I will take questions. If anyone has any, I will preface any questions, um, by saying that this is all new and it's a lot of like heavy procedure that <clears throat> even legal scholars don't know the answer to. And I'm not even one of those. I'm just a lawyer trying to read things and figure it out and then tell you about it. So um, fire away. Let me, let me scroll through some of these, um, all these other delightful super chats and stickers. Thank you so, 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 so much for your donations. Okay. Um, Fork McSpoon, my lovely Patreon supporter. Hello. 
says there is a hashtag starting on TikTok, hashtag so random Texas, where people offer to fly folks randomly to their state for any reasons you might need to leave Texas for a while. <clears throat> Look, if we're going rogue with the way that they're writing laws about abortion, we can go rogue with the way that we are helping people get abortions. Just because it's law doesn't mean it's right. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> Thank you again to everyone. If you hear the snoring in the background, it is my dog. Maybe she will make an appearance later to lighten the mood. Relatedly, Idris Smith, thank you so much for your generous donation. We are team Moira here. Moira is my English bulldog. Thank you so much. Let's see who else we've heard from so far. Thank you so much to Christine Heen, my other lovely Patreon supporter for your very generous donation. Let's see. <laughs> Brett, another lovely Patreon supporter, generous donation. I hope it is a violation of the law. Thanks, Brett. All right. Thank you so much to Shelly. You're welcome for the education. I hope it's helpful. I tried to lay it out in a way that kind of follows with the, uh, you know, procedure, but it's hard. It's, co it's complicated. All right. Thank you, Christine, for your lovely donation. Daniel, another lovely Patreon supporter. So you can support me on Patreon down below. The link is down there. Sue me, Texas. I'm from Kentucky. I will fight you. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Ooh, Catherine Kelly. I'd like to see Texas try to sue me. Living abroad has benefits. <laughs> Listen, people, we're going rogue, all right? I am not encouraging anyone to break the law. I have to say that as a legal disclaimer. I, I just am enjoying the innovation I'm seeing. Kevin, it's amazing what these leaders will do. Everything to destroy the lives of their constituents than to improve them, right? It's an embryo. An embryo is not your constituent. Look, and I don't even want to get into moral arguments about like when life begins, because that's a mess. And that's something that in Roe v. Wade, the court even said, we can't make that, we can't make that determination. Philosophers, theologians, they've never figured out the specific point at which life begins. So we as nine legal nerds on the Supreme Court are not going to be able to tell you when life begins. So they drew the line in the sand saying that if a fetus can survive, is viable outside of the womb, then fine. The state probably has a vested interest in that, in that baby at that point. But before that can leave, leave the womb and stay alive, it's hard to argue that there is any sort of actual vested interest in that baby not even to mention the fact that like what kind of social services do people in texas get after the baby comes out of the womb this is all a whole other can of worms do we have any other questions thank you again for all of the donations coming in these are all going to be donated to help people get the hell out of texas to get abortion support Becca, thank you so much for your donation. I don't understand why people want to be this involved in someone else's life and body. Thank you for breaking this down and for helping those people who are going to need it. Much love to you and Moira. Thank you so much. <clears throat> it's, it's shocking. I will say I have tried to have conversations with pro-life people, pro-anti-abortion uh, people. Um, <clears throat> and their counter-argument to that is like, uh, they, we are always arguing that the government should be involved in people's lives. We, sorry, liberals, people on the left end of the spectrum are arguing that government should have involvement in people's lives, but then we're drawing this arbitrary line when it comes to abortion. I don't know. I'm just throwing out that counter argument. I just think it's interesting to like talk to people who are pro anti-abortion and to like figure out where they're coming from. But I'm kind of also getting tired of that. So maybe it's a wasted effort. Okay. Um, let's see, we got another one. Sorry, all my, all my things are loading in a very choppy way. All right. 
Oh my gosh, I don't know how to say this. Cra Craig? Is that, how you, is that a Craig with Rosie? We're still fighting here in Northern Ireland for safe access to abortion. My heart goes out to everyone in Texas with the capacity to become pregnant. Thank you. Thank you for your donation. It's a worldwide thing. Oh, that's funny, Rachel. Uh, what if this law goes against my religious beliefs? Judaism allows abortion. Theoretically, that shouldn't matter because it should be separate, shouldn't it? I don't know. I don't know, people. All right. Republican brand Christianity is the thing. Oh, we're not even going to get into the religious aspect of it because holy hell, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, I'm going to pull this up because it's a nice compliment. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Hello. Hello, Canadians. Is abortion legal there? Can we all come? Let us in. All right. Thank you again so much to everyone who is donating. Um, keep them coming. If you want to donate after this live stream has ended, I have my Venmo ooh, ooh, right there at Legion Miller. Venmo me and just make in the description like this is for abortion fund or whatever, and I'll, I'll get what you mean. And I will, again, accountability, I will post on my various social medias, which again, the handle is at Legion Miller, the benefit of having a weird name. It's all at Legion Miller. You can find all my social media that way. And uh, I will make sure to be accountable and show you where your money goes. Patrick, thank you so much. Love to anyone in Texas and worldwide from New Zealand. I really hope this doesn't harm more than it tries to help. Uh, yeah. Can we come to New Zealand? I hear it's pretty COVID free there. Sounds kind of nice. Yeah. Josie pro-birth and anti-abortion, but not pro-child, pro-help the helpless. I would have to agree with you there. Well, and all, to also, to anyone watching this, not the live stream, it seems like y'all are pretty supportive, but I get a lot of comments on my videos, a lot of comments on my videos of people being like, you're a lawyer, just stick to the facts. My good sir, <laughs> I will have whatever opinions I want. I am not representing you. I am none of your lawyers. I am a person with legal knowledge, giving my opinion based on the facts that I'm reading. And I have every right to do that because this is my own damn channel. All right? So, thanks again. Reminder, donate, call your representatives, figure out the abortion laws in your own state if you're not in Texas. Talk to your friends, support each other, and stop with the Zoom cr scrolling. All right? Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and your generosity. I will follow up at the end of this live stream with, with the amount that we've raised and I will let you know where it goes. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, Moira's not gonna make a cameo because she is fast asleep and she's a baby, so I don't wanna wake her. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe, be nice to one another, keep it cool. I, I don't know. Bye.